we continue with our discussion on how to let your palace to master you. This is a part three of the four video series on this topic. And we start off from where we left off in part two. That is the first phase of Induction Bible Study Method, which is observation. In this next phase of the observation process, we look at the question of to ask. Specifically, ask the five W's and the H question. That is, who, where, what, when, why, and how. So we look at a little bit of each of these six questions. And so, coming to the question of who, one will want to know who is speaking a particular passage, who writing or the author of that particular book, who is receiving, that is the recipient of, for example, if it's a letter, who were the people the letter was written, you know, especially the epistles. And the question of who is is about, who is being written or about, who is being spoken about, who is mentioned in a book or passage. These are examples. These are not exhaustive. As you read, as you study, depending on the particular passage of scripture, many more who questions come up. So this is a way to start. The next question is where? Where did or will this happen? Something is mentioned, an event, for example. So where did it occur? Or if it is something in the future, where is the, when will it happen? Something is said, you want to know where was it said or written? Where is the author? So this book was being written, this pronouncement was being made. Where was the author when this was being written? So this is again examples of the where question. Many more will come to mind as you uh, uh, study reflexively and meditatively. What is another group of questions? And in this one, you want to ask the question, what is the subject or event covered in this chapter or in the verse? What is the main event in the chapter? What motive lie behind the action reported or written about the, in the chapter? What actions are being taken? What do you learn about the people, event, or teaching? What do you learn, for example, about the character of God? The character of the nature of Christ, the character of the nature of the Holy Spirit. You could also ask what was happening in the world when these events, events happened. Remember, the Bible was not written in a corner. The Bible was written as the rest of the world also was continuing in its activities. And so there is a relationship between the Bible, the recipients, and the rest of the world. And there are many things in the Bible that can be dated according to what was happening in the rest of the world at the time 
that portion of the Bible was written. So questions like what events were taking place just before and or after the events described in this chapter, you know, or in the passage of scripture where you are reading, what significance is there in the way these things are described? Again, like the other question, these are just examples. Focus your mind. As you read, many more questions come to mind. <clears throat> the question of the next group is when? When is this or when was this written? That is, when in biblical history? Where on the timeline? When in the author's life, so for example, it could be possible to say, okay, at the early stage of this author's ministry, late stage, or when the author was now old. When do the events occur? Yes, or when will they occur? Remember, there were things happening. There were things that had happened. And there were things that we yet Happen. And so the question of time comes in. If it's something that happened in the past, when did it happen? If it is something that is yet to happen, when will it take place? So, is in the question of speaking, you, the question of when did he say? When did this person speak? Or action. When did this person do it? So again, these are just a few examples of the when question. The next group is the why question. Why was this letter written, for example? Why was this statement made? Or what purpose? Question of purpose, intent. Why is something being said? Or why is something being mentioned? Why would this happen? You know, why would it happen or why will it happen? Or something that is, you know, yet to happen. Yes, why at that time, when time is given, relevance of timeline again and to this you know usually it will um it will pertain to something or somebody so why at that time for example and or to this person these people those are a few of the questions in the why group then in the how group this oftentimes speaks of relationships. For example, how are the main characters related? So people mentioned in the story or in the pa passage of scripture. And so, how will it happen when something is said to be, I mean, that something is going to happen? So, or how did it happen for past events? How is it to be done for actions to be taken or things expected to be done? How is it illustrated? Oftentimes, things are illustrated, events are illustrated, so the life of people are illustrated. People's character and behavior are brought to the fore by illustration. Again, these are some of the how questions that you need to ask. Now, in all these six groups, remember, these six are not exhausted. Again, the whole issue of active reading of scripture. Remember, this is observation. You are looking intently as to what the word of God is saying. It's not about what you want the word to say. You want to listen. You want to perceive. And that's the essence of all these questions. That is the whole issue of you are asking the text question. So 
That's active reading. You are not just passing by. You are reading slowly and meditatively, observing to the minutest details. And so you observe. Remember, we're still in observation. You observe key words and phrases. You know, one rule of thumb is that a key word or phrase is one which, when removed from the sentence or the, from the passage, leaves the passage void of meaning. In other words, when you remove a key word or a key phrase, the rest of the sentence or passage will not make sense. So that's a, a, rule, uh, a rule of thumb. Because you might be saying, okay, how do I know the key word? How do I know the key phrase? They are often repeated by the author throughout a chapter or book in order to reveal the point or purpose of the writing or to indicate something to pay attention to. In other words, these key words and phrases are markers of things of importance. <clears throat> Since not every repeated word or phrase is key, again, applying the rule of remover helps to determine whether a repeated word is truly a key word. I hope you understand that. There are many repeated words and phrases that may not be key or very important. And so the rule of thumb helps you to identify of out of the several repeated keywords and phrases which ones are actually very important. Because again, you want to pursue things that will yield the needed information. You don't want to follow a rabbit trail. You don't want to be sidetracked by pursuing uh, uh, minute things that will not add to any uh, 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 meaning of what you are reading. And so the keywords and phrases also help to discover the author's logic and flow of ideas. So in this wise, you identify the main subjects and the theme that is unifying idea repeated or developed throughout a work a book or the chapter of a book. <clears throat> you pay attention to pronouns. Pronouns such as he, she, we, they, I, you, if, our. Especially be careful with that word you. In English, you could be used for a single individual. It could also be used for a number of people. And it is not always clear except you pay attention to the context. For example, when the Lord was speaking with a, a Samaritan woman, you know, in Senka, you have to be observant to know when the word you changes from the woman or from the Lord to the Samaritans as a people and also to Jews as a people represented by the Lord. And so it is very important to pay attention as they often indicate a change of direction and emphasis. For example, when it changes from he is to you say, so it's very, very important for us to recognize that. Again, one can overemphasize it. You need to recognize when you, singular, changes to you, plural, and vice versa. Note synonyms. Synonyms are different ways of referring to the same person, place, or thing. For instance, there are many names for God. 
There are several names for Jerusalem. There are very there are several ways Apostle Paul is referred to on the pages of Holy Scripture. There are different ways Holy Spirit is referred to in Holy Scripture. And so it's important to note this. This often hints at different character traits of the same entity, trying to teach us a little more about it. For example, you could decide you want to study the different names of God. You will discover that the different names emphasize or teach us about different characters of God. Look for lists. Lists are often additional words used to describe a keyword, but are also what is said about someone or something, or related thoughts, instructions grouped together. Lists are all sometimes, you know, something you should develop as you study a particular topic throughout the Bible. For example, when you look at the word grace, listing the characteristic of grace as provided by each use throughout scripture will provide you with a much broader view of the whole meaning of grace. Such a list show allows you to see the bigger picture and avoiding correctly uh, interpreting it based on just one scripture in and of itself. Examples of lists you will find in Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 11, Philippians 4 to 8, Galatians 5, 19 to 23. Lists are common on the pages of Holy Scripture, both in the Old and the New Testament. You also watch for contrasts and comparisons. Remember, we are still in observation. A contrast is a comparison of things that are different or opposite, such as light, darkness, proud, humble, good, evil, right, wrong, and so on. The word but often indicates a contrast to something just stated. Comparis a comparison points out similarities and is most often indicated in the use of words such as like, as, as it were. <clears throat> These small words are great, high, they are great eye-openers in the process of, of, of observation as they are said as they set the words on either side of them into their proper context. Again, example, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 14. <clears throat> Mark expressions of time. Time is often the most overlooked part of observation. A crucial part of attaining the correct context is understanding when something has, is, or will happen. Yes, that is, again, something might have happened, or it may be currently happening, or it will be something that will happen in the future. And there are time elements that point to this. Expressions of time include words like after, before, until, then, when, and so forth. Time is often directly indicated, you know, by so terms as, such as during the reign of so, 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 on the tenth day or at the feast of, and like phrases. Sometimes the context is as much about when or its relationship to a past or present event as it is the person 
place or thing mentioned. Pay attention to words such as until, then, when, and after as they reveal the relationship of one event to another. <clears throat> Note the terms of conclusion. Words like wherefore, therefore, so, then, for this reason, and finally, are terms of conclusion that usually follow an important thought in order to tell you how to personally apply a teaching. The term of conclusion may function in several ways. For example, identify a logical consequence or conclusion, or identify a statement which summarizes what was previously stated. Terms of conclusion could also identify a deduction from usually previously stated facts, propositions, experience, reasoning, and so forth. It could sum up a preceding argument. They are usually a bridge between the teaching and the application, and often clearly spell out the proper meaning and context of the passage with no guesswork as to what it means. To recognize this important thing, proper observation takes the guesswork out of interpretation and application. So please do not rush through observation because you want to get to the interpretation or application more quickly. Don't rush through this. If you rush, then you will later discover that you are interpreting wrongly. And if you interpret wrongly, naturally you will apply wrongly. So, interpretation and application are only properly achieved through patient and thorough observation. It is important that you read yourself of assumption and presuppositions and approach the word of God with reference and free of bias as much as possible. I'm aware that is easier said than done because we are all um, we are all cultured or trained and conforming to our traditions and cultures where we, are, we were brought up. And so it is not always easy, but the fact of life is that we all look through the gates of our tradition and culture and experience when we come to Holy Scripture. This needs to be minimized as much as possible. You must allow Holy Scripture to inform and dislodge Whatever is there in your tradition and culture that is contrary to the word of God. And so as you carry out observation on a chapter by chapter basis consistently, you will begin to see the paragraphs, sentences, and words in their proper context. Watch out for key themes that come up repeatedly. This usually helps to understand what the passage is about. De develop your own passage or chapter or book themes. <clears throat> Again, one can say this often enough. Look up words and phrases you do not understand. Make note of the question half about the text. Mark down topics or subjects you might consider for details topical study later. And we come forth to interpretation. Having diligently observed, then you now come to interpretation. Interpretation is where you 
answer the question, what does this passage mean? In observation, you have tried to answer the question, what does this passage say? Now you want to interpret what you have gathered in your process of observation. Here are some suggested basic rules. Again, these are suggestions. And as you study, you will definitely have many more that you will find important that you will want to add to this. Context is king. Identify the context in which the passage was written. Again, one can say this enough. Context always rules first. And so you will identify <clears throat> the cultural and historical setting of the time the passage was written and that of the recipients because these are important. Again, it's very important for you to understand this. Scripture can never mean what it did not mean to the original recipient. If it did not mean it to them, it cannot mean it for us today. It's important. Scripture never predicts scripture. When there are discrepancies, it is usually because of misinterpretation, misunderstanding. Again, it could, be, it could happen at any of the stages of our studying the scripture, uh, at the level of observation, at the level of interpretation, or at the level of application. But the basic truth is that Scripture never uh, contradicts scripture. The best interpreter of scripture is other scripture. One of the best study aids is a good Bible dictionary, which will show words and concepts as they are present as they are presented throughout all of scripture. This is often the best use of footnotes in your Bible that indicate other verses utilizing the same words or phrases in other places so you can compare and contrast how it used many passages. So again coming to the issue of compare and contrast, you are to look up always seeking the full cause counsel of the word of God. And so you look up the cross references. Do not read any passage of scripture in isolation or refer to other passages and interpret words and phrases within the context in which they are used. Never base a belief or conviction on an obscure passage of scripture. It is very important for you to understand this. You are fallible. Like all of us human beings, we have limitation. The best of us can never exhaustively finish the Bible. The best of us, the most intelligent of us, who devote so much time, can never understand every part of Holy Scripture. There will always be parts that we don't understand. You and all of us need to have that humility that yes, we do our best, but then our God is infinite, is able to say and to do things that as his word says, we only understand in the by and by when we are in the presence of the Lord. That should not be an excuse not to study the word. It should rather be a motivation to say, okay, I want to know as much as I can possibly know at my level as a human being. And the Holy Spirit helping me, I will learn enough to continue to please my God. So, never insist that you must understand everything. Don't build doctrine on passages of Holy Scripture that are not clear. You can always ask 
other believers. You can go to Bible dictionaries or commentaries or submit it to God in prayer and wait his direction. Even with the best of efforts, recognize this again, there will always be passages of scripture that you will never understand. But again, understand there is enough in plain sight for us all to be able to live a life that is pleasing to our God. So we should never use obscure passages as a reason not to study the word or not to do what we know God demands of us as his children. Understand that allegories and typology are used to illuminate. They are never used to create doctrine. There are many interpretation philosophies. But please interpret scripture literally. Always start with the literal interpretation of, past, uh, of, the, of the passage. Most of the Bible are very, very literal. But like our everyday speech and communication, there are also figurative speech and symbols. So these are far and away the exceptions in the Bible. Beware of false teachers who teach that all the Bible is but allegory such as Jonah and the big fish, or the Garden of Eden and all that, avoid such people because they tell you what is not there in scripture. They try to use other things to spiritualize holy scripture. Remember, for example, the story of Jonah actually happened. It was an historical event. Is not a parable. The Garden of Eden is not a parable. It's an historical event. So don't, I mean, avoid people who want to spiritualize these things as illustrating one thing or the other. So for these events, places and things in Bible are real and not allegory. They are not imaginary. They are not illustrations. They are real events. God is very clear in scripture when he uses allegory, parables, or other literary devices to communicate his word. And you cannot mistake those things when they are used. They are, it, they are usually obvious as compared to uh, uh, the literal events. You should therefore note figures of speech and symbols. Find out their meaning and give them their due place where a literal interpretation will not give a clear interpretation. Again, one has said this on occasion, look for the single meaning of a passage. Scripture has only one. Let the passage speak for itself. If you allow the passage to speak, you will get the one meaning a passage having. Seek to understand what the author had in mind. Only one meaning, though there will be several applications. Again, avoid looking for hidden meanings. Flee from those that teach about things such as Bible codes or try to twist scripture to support a meaning it never had in the first place. Making something complicated is usually an outward sign of someone that is going to great lengths to justify sin in their life or the choices they have made that often do not have any bearing with Holy Scripture. Always remember that allegories and typology always illuminate what is already present in scripture. They never create something new, their own. So we come now to application. And in application, you want to answer the question, 
what does this message mean to me, Asana? Too big assumption that you have done your observation thoroughly and diligently. You have allowed scripture to speak. You have minimized your own biases and prejudices. You are willing to confront to be confronted by the truth. The other thing is you have rightly within the limit of what you have been able to discover and what you have allowed the Holy Spirit to teach you to correctly interpret scripture. So you now you have observed correctly, diligently, you have uh, you have interpreted. You now want to see how this applies to you. That's what why the question you want to answer here is what does this message mean to me, Asana? And so remember again the issue that this tool is to master you. The word that we are doing the study yourself. The word is to speak to you. It is not you focusing on others as to who, how your spouse can change or be transformed, how their brother, how their sister, or how that pastor can change. It is always a reference to you, how you can be transformed. It is what does it mean? And as we continue, you will understand why. So it is important you recognize this truth. Holy Scripture transforms the believer. Let us remind ourselves of the testimony of Holy Scripture as to its ability to transform us as we attempt to apply the Word of God to our lives and potentially to the lives of others. And so, this wise, before we continue with application, let's hear what the Scripture says about itself. Potency again. <clears throat> All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Second Timothy three, sixteen to seventeen. So it's important we recognize and accept this truth of Holy Scripture. So from this passage, we can see the activities involved in application, teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, and adequacy or competency in good work because the believer becomes equipped adequately for good work. Remember, God only asks us to do Work. God will never ask you to work. And so looking at this, we see that <clears throat> teaching is causing to know something. Yes. Hence, teaching is what the Word of God has to say on any topic or subject. And it's always once you discover what the Word of God teaches. You are obligated before God to accept that truth and to live by it. Up to the point where you did not know the facts, you may have been claiming ignorance. But immediately the facts are revealed. Immediately the truth is revealed to you and you come to understand it. Ignorance stops. And then your rebellion becomes really, your disobedience becomes really frank rebellion against God. You must therefore, <clears throat> you must there and then cast away any false beliefs or teaching you may have previously held. I hope you understand that. Once you get informed of the truth, whatever is in you, whatever is in your experience that is contrary, must be ready to let them go and be replaced by the truth of the word of God. That is the essence of teaching. You get information that is superior to what you already have, and then you let go 
of the inferior information and you embrace the truth, the word of God. That is how teaching becomes effective in your life. Reproof. To reprove is to scold or express disapproval or disapproval with kindly intent. It is, this is not judgmental or rash, you know, putting down of somebody. You find out where you have thought or behaved wrongly or have not been doing what God says is right according to his word and disapprove of it in yourself and make necessary amend immediately. Yes, remember when you saw reproof, perhaps you were thinking of, oh, uh, uh, scolding others or reproving others. No, remember again, it is first about you. The word of God is the master. You are looking at yourself in the mirror of the word of God. You are seeing the spots, you are seeing the blemishes and wrinkles. And the word of God is telling you these things are not right. They need to be put right. That is, God's word is scolding you. God's word is expressing God's approval. The approval with disapproval of your habit or character or a trait in you with kindly intent. Again, the essence of God's reproof is correction. It's so that you can go back. God is actually giving you a time to repent. That's the essence of the reproof of God. God does not chasten to destruction. He chastens to return you to him. It is your personal acknowledgement that you were wrong in thought or behavior. And now, accept and agree with God, with God, with God's truth, setting you free from sin and unbelief. Again, the word correction comes in. It's, correction is a bringing into conformity with a standard. And so, in reproof, you see what you are doing wrong. You accept. Acceptance is correction. You are accepting that, oh, I was wrong. I've been ignorant of this. Now I know the truth. So, correction in practice is conformity. You now set aside, you jettison the false standard or the wrong information with which you were operating before because you have now seen in the word of God that you are being reproved. God is displeased from, you know, with the way you have been doing things because it has not been according to his word. And so now you are being corrected. The correction is you have seen the truth. So you accept that superior information and then you put aside the old one. So the word of God is a standard that must be attained. To. Again, one can say it enough. The word of God is the master. You are the pupil. You are the one who is to bring yourself under the, the, the word of God. It's not the other way around. It's not you telling the word of God what to tell you. It is you listening to the word of God with the intent that when you know the truth, you are going to act on it. You are not just going to wave it aside and continue with your, with your life as usual. Hence, correction is a step wherein the knowledge you gain from teaching and reproof are put into action, resulting in change behavior in you and your hearers. Again, remember, it is you first. It is you that must change. It is converting knowledge into obedience. Remember what the word of God tells people. He said, when others see you, you obey God. They will marvel at the wisdom by which you live your life. That wisdom is not from you. That wisdom, the wisdom of God. And when you are saved, the Bible says you become a partaker of God's nature. And so the essence of his word is to bring more of and more of that nature out so that 
others we see in your life. As our Lord said, that when you work, people, you should allow you should allow your light to shine so that people will see that light and they will glorify your Father in heaven because of your good works. It is the Word of God that converts you, that transforms you regularly, closer and closer to the character of Christ. Training in righteousness. Training is to form by instruction, discipline or drill. In other words, something you are not used to doing, you are made to do it repeatedly until you get to know it, then you can do it yourself. So it's a drill, it's a discipline. It is to teach, to make fit, you know, qualified or proficient. It's something you repeat regularly, consistently until you understand and then you're able to perform. Say for example, you want to train as a doctor, you go to medical school, you go through rigorous training for a period of time until those who are training you are satisfied that you have got to the level of discipline or drill that you are now proficient in what they have been putting into you, putting you through to make you a safe doctor, that others can commit their lives to you when they are ill. That is, you have been trained as a medical doctor. This concept takes place in almost every profession. And so it is the same. The Word of God brings you in righteousness. So, <coughs> training is right in righteousness in terms of God's word, is taking in the word in such a way that it conforms you to the standard of the word of God. Again, remember the essence of you taking personal responsibility to study the word of God is so that you can know the truth and be more conforming to the standards and the demands of God so that every day you are cooperating with the Holy Spirit as he continues his, his work of progressive sanctification in your life and you get closer and closer to the character of Christ. And the Holy Bible is a handbook for living. For how we conduct ourselves. One way to put this is that your whole existence in this life is training yourself to leave heaven. You are learning things that are contrary to the kingdom of God as you live in this foreign land called the world. So that by the time you get to your real world, you will able to live the way you should live. It is continually returning to the source and consistently putting into practice the reproofs and correction, yes, of his word to build your character in again, reigning in righteousness. That's what it simply means. You continually return to the source that is the word of God, consistently putting into practice the roof proofs, the correction, the training of his word to build your character in. Adequate, equipped. In other words, adequate, you are complete. You lack nothing. The word of God is adequate for all God requires of you, the believer. This might sound unrealistic or unbelievable on the surface, but that is the truth. There is nothing you need that the Word of God cannot, when appropriately studied and interpreted, supply. With the Word, the child of God can live a life pleasing to God and complete the journey of faith 
triumphantly victory. So you are equipped. So your gift is to furnish to service or action by appropriate provisioning. You are made ready. In other words, studying the word of God, being reproved, being corrected, being trained, all these equip you adequately. Yes. Provisioned for all good work that God has ordained for you. Again, remember, it starts with God, it ends with God. It is God who has prepared those works for you. It is also God who demands that you perform those works. It is also God who provides the provision and the equipment, the training, all that you need to accomplish what he has ordained for you. And so it is important for you to recognize this. The word of God in you, the believer, makes you ready for life's eventualities. We stop here. This is the end of part three. The next part and the last in this video series will be part four. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>